everybody. Welcome to church. We got about five minutes before the service starts, so here are some church appropriate dance moves you can do whenever the spirit moves you. So get on up and let's sweat to some scriptures. Or maybe not. Or just, just let's go. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Make sure it's on the face. See it on the face. Yeah. Bring it together. Here we go. Let it go. You take the stone, you let it go. You're unhindered by armor. Let that elbow sway. Elbow, 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 elbow. Okay. One of my personal favorites. Resurrection. You gotta get down to get back. Yeah. Keep working, guys. Keep working. You're doing great. I'm doing great. I'm getting a little tired. Stomp hard, stomp hard, stomp hard. You're crushing it, crushing it, crushing it. Yeah. Okay, good break there, good break. Good job, guys. Here we go, ready? Get that, get that whip going. Scare those tax collectors, those merchants. Yeah. Merchants. Make sure you look afraid. And this is salt. You look back and salt, salt, salt. I'm getting to you. You're doing great, everybody. I'm, oh, almost. Okay, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Two minutes, 30 seconds left. Here we go. Close again. One, two, three, four. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. You got his blessing. Two minutes left. I wonder. I'm gonna go for the bucket. No! I'm not gonna be okay. okay. Sharp the knife. Ride the horse up the mountain with the knife. Put your boy in the back. Hoist it up! No! Hoist it up! Abraham, no! Hoist it up! Abraham, no! One out of thirty guys. We can do this. Okay, this one's important. The meekness is important. All right, one minute, guys. We're doing great. Keep it meek, but then watch this. This is not meek. Coming at the end. With swords! Swords! Cut down the enemy! Flame them dead! Flame them dead! Flame them dead! Whoo! Whoo! Yeah, there! Can you do it? This one's important too! We're just sowing the seeds! Here we go! Sow it! Make sure you hit that! Fertile ground! Stay away from that! Watch your back. No, God's got it for you. Watch your back. No, God's got it for you. I don't know how much more I can do this. You're gonna have to take it for me. On the last push, literally. Samson, what are you doing? Put it. Okay, guys, we're gonna have to start. Let's just start the service.
Well, good morning, Sharptown Church. Welcome to worship. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I want to open and read to you a couple verses out of Psalm 100. In Psalm 100, verse number four, we read, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. That is what we celebrate this morning, God's goodness and God's faithfulness from generation to generation. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We celebrate you. We pray this morning that the words that we sing, that the attitude of our hearts would be a pleasing aroma to you. May our worship fill your throne room with praise. Lord, we love you this morning, and we are so excited to gather together in worship. Lord, bless those who seek after you this morning. Meet us today. Lord, we're thankful for our praise team who comes here and, and leads us in worship. We're thankful for all the folks who join with us at home. And Lord, we pray and celebrate that we're going to be back together again soon. But help us to realize that even though we aren't together physically, we are still together. Lord, you tell us whenever two or three are gathered that you come and join us. And so we invite you to join us this morning in this sanctuary and in our living rooms and in our dining rooms or wherever we might find ourselves this morning. Lord Jesus, we are so excited to be with you and to be in your presence. We give this next hour to you. In your name we pray. Amen. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore I have a loving mother just over in the glory land And I don't expect to stop until I shake her hand She's waiting now for me in heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world Shout victory. This song sweet as praise, dripping bath and shore, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore and I can't be let home in this world anymore oh no one could build a house like Jesus no one could build a house like Jesus no one could build a house like Jesus. He's the greatest carpenter I know. No one could build a house like Jesus. No one could build a house like Jesus. No one could build a house like Jesus. He's the greatest carpenter I know. 
carpenter I know. This house was built on a solid foundation. This house was built on a solid foundation. House was built on a solid foundation. He's the greatest carpenter I know. Oh, no one can build a house like Jesus. I said no one can build a house like Jesus. No one can build a house like Jesus. He's the greatest carpenter I know. This house is built to stand the test of time. This house is built to stand the test of time. This house is built to stand the test of time. He's the greatest carpenter I know. Oh, no one can build a house like Jesus. No one can build a house like Jesus. No one can build a house like Jesus. He's the greatest carpenter I know. Take it, day. No force upon his earth can tear it down. He's the greatest carpenter I know. Oh, no one can build a house like Jesus. I said no one can build a house like Jesus. No one can build a house like Jesus. He's the greatest carpenter I know. Glory, 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 hallelujah. Glory, 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 hallelujah. Glory, 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 hallelujah. He's the greatest carpenter I know. Yes, I know. He's the greatest carpenter. Ooh, yes, I know. He's the greatest carpenter I know. This place is rocking this morning. I sure hope that you guys are having a grand time at home. I'll tell you what, it was cool to see Pastor Jerry and Pastor Doug and Ben and Joe sing with us last week in their quartet. But I'll tell you what, they were cool, but they don't hold a candle to this quartet. Thanks, guys, for being here this morning. This is just awesome. Uh, I want to invite you and encourage you that we still have a lot of praise and worship, a couple more songs this morning, and then back again by popular demand. Jeremiah Jameson is again hosting a worship evening tonight at his home. So that's going to be 7 p.m. on Facebook Live, a night of worship. He is again taking requests. And so I invite you to jump back on right here on the church Facebook page. You have nowhere else to go anyway. I don't think the governor's lifted restrictions until tomorrow. And so we are excited about some things to come. But join us this evening at 7 p.m. In addition to that, I'll continue to remind you each and every week that we have a daily message from somebody on our staff or our congregation each and every day at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. Jump on. You will be blessed. If you can't join us at that time, all of those messages are posted on the church website, and so you can listen to them anytime that you are able. And then again, we are going to continue to thank you each and every week. Sharptown Church is an amazing, special place. You know that. I know that. But we continue to celebrate that your faithfulness and your generosity are just amazing. And so our giving seems to hold around 90, 92%. That's just so exciting. I want to just invite you and encourage you, if you'd like to give to Sharptown Church, there's a number of ways you can do that. You can use our Give Plus app. You can use the website, or you can mail a check to the church. We just want to say thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your faithfulness. At this time, if you'd like to go ahead and make a donation, you can do that. If you would take a moment and let us know how many in your family have joined us this morning, that kind of helps us to gauge our worship attendance. So again, thank you for joining us. We still have a tremendous time in store this morning. Would you pray with me once again? Dear Heavenly Father, everything that we have is because you have blessed us. 
And so, Lord, at this moment or sometime this week or maybe over the weekend, we give back to you a portion of what's yours anyway. We give out of love. We give out of obedience. We give out of generosity because of what you have done in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would use what's given to make a difference in your kingdom. Continue to direct Sharp Town's paths. We will be diligent to listen for your voice and follow where you lead. Lord, we love you this morning. Once again, thank you for who you are. You are good. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, folks, we are going to continue in worship this morning. Where could I go but to the Lord? Living below in this so sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore. Now tell me, won't you, where could I go but to the Lord? Sing along with me. Oh, where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. To help me in the end Now tell me now Where could I go but to the Lord The neighbors are kind Well I love them everyone And we get along and sweet accord mm, but when my soul needs man a form above tell me now where could I go but to the Lord tell me now where could I go oh where refuge for my soul, needing a friend to help me in the end. Now tell me now, where could I go but to the Lord? Life here is grand with friends I love so dear comfort I get from God's own word yeah when my face is chilling chilling hand of death now tell me now where can I go but to the Lord sing along yeah 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 where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Now tell me now, where could I go? To the Lord. Now tell me now, where could I go? But to the Lord. Where could I go? Yeah, yeah, nothing. Where could I go? But to the Lord.
Now we're going to do an old song called In the Garden. <laughs>
answer. Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Call upon me, and come, and pray to me. Join me for a word of prayer. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts collectively, as we're gathered in living rooms all around the county and beyond, may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. If there is anything of eternal value that would happen today, Lord, we would recognize that it's because your Holy Spirit is moving inside of our hearts. Be the one who's our teacher. Continue, we pray to speak to our hearts and to our lives, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome again, Sharptown. We're glad to have you here uh, on this Sunday morning. I wanted to share with you just an experience that I've had recently, and as well to think with you about a very pertinent topic inside of our Christian experience and our journey together. I really would like to just invite you to go with me uh, on some things that I've been learning and being reminded of during the last several weeks as I've been uh, kind of quarantined and doing some things around the church as well. How many of you have had the experience where you have heard a song and it gets lodged inside of your heart, lodged inside of your mind, and you can't seem to shake it? Do you know that there is a term for that? It's called an earworm, an earworm. Maybe the most famous, now listen, I know that if I do this, I am taking a huge risk. Because if I introduce this song to you, it is likely that many of you will not hear a thing that is said for the remainder of our time together. So I'm willing to take that risk just to go ahead and share with you what's been going on inside of my heart and my life. An earworm. Uh, Maybe the best known earworm all around the world is this. Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark, do 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 do. Baby shark, do 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 do. And once you hear that song, uh, for whatever reason, it just does not seem to leave you. Well, a few weeks ago, I was working through an article that I was reading online from the Francis Asbury Society. It was written by the past president of Asbury College. You've heard me speak of him frequently. His name is Dennis Kinlaw. Dennis Kinlaw wrote an article and and there was a sentence or two that grabbed my attention and has become, I don't know if it's an earworm, but it has become kind of a heartworm, if you will, if that's such a thing. God has seemed to lodge this and plant this deeply within my heart. I've been thinking about it. I've been turning it over time and time again. And I don't know that there's anything incredibly profound about it as much as It just has been something that God has used to remind me of my accountability about my relationship with Him. And so as a result of that, I would like to kind of round out some thinking about this particular topic and then would also like to share with you a couple of quick points as we close our time together today. So here is the quote. It comes again out of a newsletter from the Francis Asbury Society. And Dr. Kinlaw begins and he talks about the idea of having a conversation with God. And here's what he says. Conversations with God move history. Now, right there is where I stopped. The idea of prayer and the idea of having a relationship and having a conversation with God certainly is something that 
all of us are familiar with. However, I'm not sure I ever read that this way. Conversations with God move history. We tend to think about geniuses or great leaders and all of the rest. But I'm ready, says Dr. Kinlaw, to make the case that a conversation with God will ultimately determine history. And then he writes this sentence. How hard it is, though, for God to get on your calendar and to get on my calendar. And that's where the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and to begin to probe my heart. He goes on with the article and he says this, that when God spoke to Moses and Moses had to reply back, all of human history shifted. Since conversations with God are of such huge importance, how can we neglect them? How can we neglect them? And then this thought, there is no one, nobody, with whom a conversation is as important as a conversation with God. That paragraph has lodged itself uh, deep inside of my heart during these last several weeks. One of the things we began to implement here at Sharptown Church was on Friday, began to have an hour of prayer together. I was unprepared for how formidable and how God is using that to shape me in the midst of our time apart. Most of my time then in prayer has been working through a directory of names uh, with your names on it as we've been asking God to intercede and move on your behalf and in the life of Sharptown Church and for wisdom about how to continue to move forward in the midst of this pandemic and what are the next steps for Sharptown and I invite you to join me in prayer about these topics. Now today though I wanted to talk a little bit about the idea of prayer and say that this becomes an intimidating, intimidating conversation. The conversation with God is more readily accessible for me than having a discussion about prayer sometimes as far as a preaching moment. In a book that Tim Keller writes on prayer, he says this, that prayer is an exceedingly difficult subject to speak about and to write about. Primarily because when we talk about our prayer lives, when we talk about having a conversation with God, we feel small, we feel helpless. And there is a sense of personal inadequacy that comes when we speak about prayer. That's true to some degree. On Sunday mornings when we gather together and we have a chance to open God's Word, it is important that we share our transparency with one another, not only some things that we're taking steps forward in, but also areas that we may not be where we want to be in our Christian experience and in our Christian growth. I don't know that there's anyone today who would be joining me on this broadcast that would make the statement that they believe that their prayer life is sufficient or that it's not lacking in some way. It becomes a great source of thinking about inadequacy, but that's not why I want to think about that today. I want to talk a little bit about the idea that if conversations with God move history, and if conversations with God are that significant, then how are we doing inside of our own conversations with God? Do you know the Bible is replete? It has conversation after conversation after conversation that people have with God. And oftentimes, the result is indeed a change of history. Again, to reference uh, Tim Keller's book on prayer called Experiencing All in Intimacy with God. Tim Keller says, though, that not only it, talking about prayer is hard because we feel inadequate, actually having a conversation with God is incredibly hard because we feel inadequate. He has a section of his book in the first couple of chapters called the hardness of prayer, 
or why is prayer so hard? And he makes the statement that if something is great inside of our life, it's great because it has experienced some difficulty as it becomes great. If it means something to us, it's likely we've gone through some struggle in order to get there. And so Keller identifies some areas of struggle in prayer. Times where we don't feel as though we're connecting with God. Times when we're praying and we feel lonely. Times when we're praying and we feel empty or there's a hunger inside of us. And then there's the difficult time, says Keller, when we're praying and we come face to face with our own pettiness, with our own disorientation with our own need inside of our life. We recognize that prayer is not the easiest sort of thing, that it is hard. Years ago, Billy Graham in an article inside of his magazine says that for many people, prayer is not a joy, but it's a burden. As a matter of fact, when people don't pray, they feel guilty. When they do pray, they feel like they might be doing it incorrectly. The disruptions in their time and the way in which they pray, they can't focus, they can't concentrate. Prayers seem stiff and they don't feel like a conversation. But the Bible never ever backs away from the invitation for us to be people who pray consistently inside of our journey with Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, these are the verses that continue to prompt us and remind us how significant prayer is, the conversations with God that move and shape history. 1 Thessalonians invites us to be people who live in an attitude of prayer and in relationship with God such that we are praying without ceasing, not only using words but the utterances of our heart. In Acts 2.42, in the description about the early church, it says that when the people gathered together in homes, they broke bread together. They were uh, people who would learn from one another. They would be attentive to the apostles' teaching. And they were people who prayed. And as a result of their faithfulness, God continued to add to their numbers daily inside of the life of the early church. Jesus speaks about the idea of prayer, and he doesn't say, if you pray. He doesn't say, oh, by the way, when you get around to praying. It's almost an expectation that Jesus has for those who were his followers. When you pray. This section of Matthew chapters uh, 6 and 7, you find then Jesus, the one who is the divine second person of the Trinity, talking about how to talk to the Father, the first person of the Trinity. But prayer is difficult sometimes, and we just want to admit that today and and recognize that it's not something that comes easily for us. It's a learned behavior, if you will, in the Christian experience. It's not as though we say yes to Jesus on Monday, and on Tuesday we're spending hours together with Him. This is a learned behavior, it seems to be. This is the reason why the disciples, it's the one thing they ask Jesus to teach them. Will you teach me, Lord, how to pray? And different people down through the history of the church who've written on this topic talk about the importance of asking that question repeatedly at different stages of their Christian experience. Philip Yancey, inside of his book on prayer, he uses this quote and he says this. He said, prayer invites me to lower my defenses and present the self that no other person fully knows to a God who already knows. There's something about prayer that makes us feel incredibly vulnerable, not only in sitting before God, but also in having to ask God to examine our hearts. The Bible says that we have a God who looks past the exterior and He knows our hearts. And for some people, that can be absolutely 
a joy and a thrill that God interprets in the utterances of our heart and, and He sees past the exterior and He knows us. But there may be moments inside of our Christian experience where the vulnerability of having a God who knows us that well and who has created us is terrifying or it's vulnerable. As a result then, I just want to think with you about some of the things that become obstacles inside of our lives when we are having or wanting to have conversations with God. Because, friends, listen, if conversations with God change history, I want you to know I want to be part of that. This is where the intersection of the practical and the theoretical meet inside of your prayer life and inside of my prayer life. This is how we play a part in God's kingdom plan for us to have the opportunity to make a difference inside of the world. It is through prayer and is the opportunity to have a conversation with God. And the things that we talk to God about make a difference in the history of our world. And so let me just explore a couple of real quick obstacles that happen for us inside of our life or why it becomes difficult for us to continue in these conversations with God. I don't want to spend a lot of time on each one of these. We probably could take a day uh, or a time together for each one, a message about each one, but I don't want to do that. I wanted to go ahead and then just highlight these and, and recognize that I feel these inside of my own personal life and most other people who pray go through seasons when they've experienced this as well. That when we pause and we sit in God's presence, there are times when guilt becomes an overwhelming sense of feeling. This happened inside of the book of Genesis where Adam and Eve were disobedient and God comes in the cool of the evening. And their first response was, they wanted to cover up and hide from God because that is our first response when we are indeed guilty. It's interesting then that when we have a tendency to go ahead and cover up in that situation and we think that we're protecting ourselves because we're covering up, God interprets that as that you don't trust me. You won't trust me with these areas inside of your life. And so we feel guilty and we try to protect ourselves. I read a story recently about a preacher whose name is Haddon Robinson. And he is a gentleman who's written a number of books about preaching. He has one of the leading preaching books actually used inside of graduate schools around the country. Haddon Robinson, when he stands in front of a congregation, in his opening prayer, before he preaches, he prays this prayer. God if these people knew about me what you know about me, they wouldn't listen to a word I have to say. And that's how we feel sometimes, isn't it? That our Christian experience and our internal lives, sometimes there is an incompatibility, they don't match. And there are occasions when we do not pray because that feeling is so overwhelming. And I want to say to you, He already knows your heart. See if you can push past those feelings of guilt. See if you can push past those feelings so that you can sit in the presence of God because the one who made you and knows you best loves you most. There's a feeling of helplessness. And listen, that's a hard feeling. We've all felt that these past couple of weeks. We can't control our circumstances. And that out of control feeling sometimes interrupts even our conversations with God. The heart attitude where we, we just feel as though we can't do anything and God sees us, we feel helpless, sometimes is an obstacle for prayer. But I want to say to you, if you can maybe look at that from a different perspective, I want to tell you that helplessness is one of the things that actually qualifies us to have a conversation with God. The hymn writer said it this way, Nothing in my hands I bring, 
simply to the cross I cling. When different people write about this idea of prayer, for instance, a guy named Henry Nouwen says this about prayer, that prayer is the declaration of my helplessness and my dependence upon God. We've mentioned that recently in a sermon series about grace, and we said this, that God gives grace to those who come with empty hands. Sometimes our helplessness becomes an obstacle instead of uh, something that is a desirable part of our Christian experience. Maybe we can flip that. And those of us who feel like we're wildly out of control when we sit in God's presence, I just want to say confess that and declare that before God. And He wants to come alongside of you in the midst of your helpless feelings during this time. We feel humble when we come before God who is all-powerful and we can't seem to make a difference in our circumstances. When we pause to pray, we publicly make a confession that there is a God and I am not it. That is a difficult feeling sometimes, especially when we have character traits or personality traits, when we like to control everything inside of our world. It's difficult, then. People find that the humility of prayer becomes an obstacle. The fact that my life is wildly out of control and I want to tell God that that's the case. Can I tell you that when we try to demonstrate to God that we have this all together, when we try to use prayer as a convincing platform that, to change God's mind, The Bible talks specifically against that. The Bible says that when we are proud, that God doesn't listen, but instead He gives grace to the humble. And when we exalt ourself, it's something that is counterproductive in our Christian experience. A couple more, I don't want to spend a great deal of time here, but when we pray, oftentimes the doubts seem to bubble up inside of my life and maybe in yours as well. When we're asking God to do something that seems like a big ask of God, we, in the back of our minds, we're wondering, is God really going to show up? Is this situation really going to change? I'm reminded of the line in Scripture where somebody comes to Jesus and said, Lord, I do believe, but help my unbelief. There are times when we fail to pray because when we do pray, it requires a a good bit of honesty. And oftentimes, it's hard. We say words, but maybe we really don't even believe the words we're saying. Philip Yancey says that when we pray, oftentimes, it's what we think and how we're feeling that actually might be the real prayer, not the words. C.S. Lewis said that we ought to lay before God what is in us, not what ought to be in us. It's a funny thing, I think, inside of the Christian experience, to even in prayer, when God knows our hearts, we attempt to put on a facade, a mask, We try to be someone potentially that we just aren't. And ultimately it's because I think we feel exposed when we sit before God. That's a vulnerable experience. That's what happened for Adam and Eve in Genesis. Exposed. It's also what happened for Isaiah in chapter 6. When These words are recorded in Scripture and he is working in the temple and it says that he saw the Lord high and lifted up and God's glory was present. And he said these words, Woe is me! I am undone! That's not an uncommon response for people in prayer. When people are confronted with the very presence of God, the idea of being exposed happens repeatedly. But I I want you to know today that these things that 
sometimes become obstacles can also be the thing that compels us into God's presence. That no one can care for our guilt inside of our life except for God himself. That we have the capacity to confess those sins and he will remove them. That we are indeed helpless by ourselves. And all of our help comes from outside of who we are. That he is the one who helps us to walk rightly before him. That our faith can increase and our doubt can decrease. That he can increase in our life and we can decrease. And that we in fact can walk rightly with him. And so how then do we go ahead and and activate this area inside of our life when we struggle with guilt or we're helpless or we struggle with what it means to be humble and and how to remove some of these doubts. I just wanted to close our time with highlighting uh, just a, a couple of ideas. There are plenty we could look at today, but I wanted to go ahead and just give you four words that all begin with the letter S today. And uh, I want to just say, uh, again, these are found in Matthew chapter uh, uh, 6 and 7, where Jesus is teaching about prayer. But I wanted to go ahead and just to give us some encouraging words as we continue in this time of isolation and pandemic. And as the state continues to open up little by little, perhaps your prayer life would continue to increase. And I wanted to give you just a couple of tools to help us as we further our Christian experience together. First of all, it's this. We just want to keep it simple when we think about prayer. Oftentimes, we try to make this way too complicated, and we try to go ahead and use language that otherwise we don't use in any other section inside of our life. Just talk to God. Just talk to God. And uh, one author said it this way, the only way to fail at prayer is to fail to pray. The only way to fail at prayer is to fail to pray. And so I just want to invite you to have a conversation with God because conversations with God change history. So keep it simple. And then Jesus speaks specifically about the sincerity of this. Be sincere. Don't pray words that aren't part of your vocabulary. Don't try to sound pious in situations where, listen, we're petrified or terrified to sit in God's presence. Just be sincere. When you pray says uh, John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. When you pray, says John Bunyan, uh, it would be better to let your heart be almost without words than to let your words be without heart. Don't just use words that are meaningless, the Bible says. Jesus actually counsels against this. And so we want to pray prayers that are simple in conversations. We want to be sincere in our conversation with God. And then we want to be systematic. We want to have a plan to pray. Now this looks different for all of us. Certainly, as we pray without ceasing throughout the day and carve out time, we want to ask the question about when do we actually do this conversation with God that may potentially change history. For instance, if someone were to ask you, Well, Doug, when do you pray that you'd be able to answer and it wouldn't be a moving target that there would be some systematic time where you would have with God, whether it's early in the morning, over coffee, whether it's seated in a chair that you pray specifically, whether it's a location, whether it's a time, uh, we want to go ahead and try to be systematic. That helps us in our discipline. Because, as Keller said earlier, the things that are the most benefit for us inside of our Christian experience regularly are hard. And this is a learned behavior that's hard. If we're systematic about it, we have a greater chance of adding this discipline that it becomes a meaningful part of my life. I was really interested to uh, read a story Uh, that Tim Keller talks about in his book about prayer. He said that he began to work his way through the Psalms because that is the prayer literature of the Old Testament. He said he tried to do this every single day. And then this sentence caught my mind and caught my eye. He said it was 
into the third year that things began to be meaningful for him about this discipline. So he was reading the Psalms in the morning and the evening, and he was working his way through the book of Psalms repeatedly, and it wasn't until year number three that it became something that God began to break loose inside of his life. Without a systematic approach, I think oftentimes we, uh, we lose what God might have for us in the journey. So we want to be simple. We want to be sincere. We want to go ahead and be s- systematic. And one last phrase that comes to us out of uh, Jesus' admonition about how we should pray. We want to be people who are secretive about our prayer. And by this I don't mean that this is just private prayer and Jesus is concerned about us publicly praying. He's concerned about the attitude of our heart whenever we publicly pray. It's not so much about location, but it's about motivation. And then he tells the story actually about a person who prays in the temple and thumps on his chest and draws all spotlights in his direction. Well, that's not what prayer is about at all, because God meets those who are humble in prayer, not those who are exalted in prayer. So four things, really, just that all begin with S as we continue on in our journey, just as a reminder, and that is this. We want to keep it simple. We want to be sincere. We want to be systematic in our prayer life. We want to pray secretly, spend that time alone with God. As we come to the close then of our time together today, I just want to go ahead and take a look at a few more verses inside of Scripture. There are verses that kind of capture our attention because of the circumstances where they are found. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, there is this incredible supernatural outpouring of God's power. And it's found in the midst of a combative circumstance where Jehoshaphat, who is the king of Judah, is marching into battle against uh, a circumstance where he is far outnumbered by his enemies. And he offers this prayer. The reason I want to go ahead and share this statement with you is because there are times inside of our life when we cannot find the words that we need to articulate what we're thinking and can't even seem to go ahead and articulate and clarify what it is we want to go ahead and say. Jehoshaphat has it right inside of this situation. And he says to God, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. And I love this sentence. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I don't know about you, but there are times in my prayer life and there are times in my conversation with God that when I sit in God's presence, I feel exactly this way. I don't know what to ask for. I can't find the words. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks to us and tells us there there are times when we can't articulate the things that we need to say. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. You may have felt that way in the past couple of weeks. Some of you may now be in situations where you don't have jobs. We're not quite sure where the income is coming from. We don't know what is going to happen next in our community. Many of our graduates, certainly we've missed prom. Uh, There's no graduation exercise. Uh, We're not even quite sure we're going to college that we've been accepted at. I don't know what to do says Jehoshaphat, but my eyes are on you. And then this exact same illustration is found in the New Testament. The words look a little bit different. But here is one who was a follower of Jesus, Simon Peter. He says it this way. Where shall we go? Where shall we turn? Who can we go to? You, Lord, are the only one who has words of eternal life, we have come to believe and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. 
but we know that our eyes are on you. We are turning to you. We trust you. As we close our time together, I want to just slip in one last Bible verse that maybe you may go ahead and write down or at least look at a bit more carefully as we close. Maybe you check this out, pull up your phone, look at it a bit more carefully because in Jeremiah chapter 33, there are some incredibly encouraging words for you about having conversations with God. And today, I want to invite you as God invites you, call on me, says God. Call on me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not already know. Today, as we conclude our time together inside of worship, I want to invite you Let's continue to be people who remain faithful to this very important building block in our Christian experience, prayer. Yes, I do understand that there is a hardness to prayer, but the joy that comes with being in right relationship with God as He whispers deep in our spirit great and unsearchable things, we will not get them anywhere else except in relationship with the one who knows us best and loves us most. Call on me. Call on me. And I will answer you. May that be true for you this week as you walk in faithfulness and obedience with God, that as we have the opportunity to engage our neighbors and to share faith with them, we too might develop a conversation with God that will change the world. Will you pray with me? Help us, Lord, in this area of our spiritual disciplines. Continue to help us that we might be people who speak with you just like we're speaking with a best friend. Who find it comfortable to share the details of our heart who readily move in your direction in a systematic manner and who spend quality time with you in conversation. Lord, we confess that it's hard sometimes for you to get on our calendars. We would pray for a simple reminder today that you help us make this a priority because you want to change the world because you use people who pray. May that be true for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, Sharptown.